You know, first and foremost, I uh, want to say thank you. My name is Wesley Benali. I'm the National Tribal Practice Leader here at RDW, and I'm working out of the Phoenix office. And today we have Brian Graylick, our uh, Director of Cybersecurity. And, you know, we've been, uh, you know, really lucky to have somebody like this on, on our team to bring this type of information to you. Um, one thing to consider, you know, obviously, cybersecurity is a big component now of any operation, whether or not that's financial, your operational day-to-day -day activities, um, you know, all, it goes all down the line because of the pace at which we are, you know, uh, implementing technology to improve efficiencies, you know, this just increases the risks. But nonetheless, we want to make sure that you have a good understanding of all the tools necessary to address those risks. And more importantly, you know, pick Brian's brain to to see what you have got going on. So, you know, once again, thank you so much. And thank you for, you know, joining us today. And I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Wes. Okay, so um, this workshop was built specifically for this purpose. So nobody's ever seen this before. You guys are the first. Uh, we're going to go through um, a little bit of training here, give you guys some education uh, that's of benefit of, um, you know, gaining information that we've gathered up over, you know, more, more or less my 40 year career. We're going to give you in about, you know, 45 minutes, the amount of information uh, that you could be able to use to accurately and efficiently go in to your own company, your own tribal nation, your own casino, whatever it is and understand the major risks that are present. So we're gonna give you something that I don't think has ever been done before. Um, the other thing is we're gonna leave it at the end uh, a few minutes. Hopefully we get through all this real quick and uh, leave you guys to be able to ask some uh, questions at the end. So with that, I'll get started. So the learning objectives for today, uh, we're gonna understand what ransomware is and why it's so common. We're going to identify some strategies to help you prevent ransomware attacks. We're going to identify the top risk controls to assist your organization, your tribal nation, whatever, in implementing strong cybersecurity practices. And then we're going to learn some strategies to reduce cybersecurity risk. And some of these, as we're going to go through these, believe it or not, are actually free or little to no cost. So that's what we like to hear. Okay, so one of the things you're going to notice through here is we're gonna put this little gold key up here every time we're talking about something that's really important to take note for. So that's gonna be your little key uh, uh, to knowing that this is a really important subject. Remember it, notate it. Um, and you know, like I said at, at the uh, very beginning, uh, we'll go through everything at the end. If you got questions about something, uh, just let us know. But um, these keys are gonna be indicating really important items to note. Okay, so what is ransomware and why is it so prevalent? Well, there's a couple of good reasons why it's so prevalent, but let's first start with what ransomware is. So many of you already have heard ransomware is when some piece of malware gets injected into your, your uh, environment on a system. Uh, could be going through an email, could be in a laptop, could be a website that you visited, whatever. The ransomware goes in, looks for where you're storing information. It doesn't care what kind of information. It's just looking for information that's stored. It will take that information and it will encrypt it, which means to put it into a container that you have to then have a code to be able to get to. Well, what this basically does then is it locks it away so that the legitimate users of that data or that information can't get to it. So if you're a tribal nation healthcare operation, uh, you can't get to patient medical records. You can't get to staffing or scheduling or anything. If you're in the accounting group, you can't get to payroll. You can't get to accounts payable. You can't pay the bills. Um, if you're in the casino, you can't uh, operate the casino. If you're in a hotel, you can't function the hotel, you know, uh, function as a hotel. You can't, you know, put people in, can't check them out. You can't process credit cards, anything. So ransomware basically takes any organization and then renders it useless, uh, inoperable, until you're able to get the code from the ransomware group and then be able to put that code in, it mysteriously, magically unlocks the data and all, all is well. Well, that's what you think. Unfortunately, as the cases happen, 
is you'll go through and you'll pay the ransom. Uh, you get the code, and when you put the code in, your data is garbage. It happens sometimes. It's not because of any kind of nefariousness on the part of the ransomware company. It's just in the way that encryption works. And in some storage systems, when you decrypt it, it doesn't come back out the way it was put in. So we kind of analogize it to uh, you know, putting meat into a sausage grinder. When it comes out, it's never going to look like whatever it was that went in. So just remember that, um, that what we want to do is prevent ransomware from happening in the first place. And you don't want to have to worry about what you're going to do if you get ransomware on your systems. Because trust me, there's a lot more to this than just getting a, paying for a code and getting a code and unlocking the data. OK, so why is it so prevalent? If you look at this chart, 2019, you're going to see that uh, the largest companies in the world as of uh, 2019, Walmart was the largest at a half a trillion dollars. Uh, these are you know, the uh, revenue numbers. Uh, Walmart, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and Tesla. OK, if you look at the very far right-hand column in 2019, cybercrime was over three times larger than the total revenues for Walmart for the entire year 2019. Now that was just in 2019. So what happened since? Well, the next two slides are gonna explain why ransomware has become so prevalent now. So 2022, here we go, $1.5 trillion. Do you think it doubled? Yeah, it doubled. Tripled? No, we're still not done. It quadrupled. In three years, $6 trillion last year cybercrime generated in revenue for these various countries and groups and organizations. Now, if you were part of this industry, if you were you know, doing ransomware or had a ransomware operation, would you quit your job if you were making this kind of money? Mm, no. In fact, drug dealers have given up uh, you know, doing drug transactions in order to get into the ransomware trade because it's much more lucrative. So this is the kind of money that's being made. And if you look at the gross national products or revenues of countries, the United States being number one, China being number two, cybercrime would then be the third largest economy on planet Earth. It's that big. It outnumbers almost every other country's gross national product for the entire year of 2022. That's why this is going on. Do you see here, the chart shows that the, the revenue numbers aren't just going up linearly, they're going the revenue numbers are going up, uh, not just linearly, but uh, like a rocket. Twenty twenty three expectations are it could hit eight trillion dollars. Now, as of March, they're already looking and saying it could hit nine. So again, we're looking at a tremendous amount of additional numbers and dollars coming out of our pockets going to these criminals. Here's some numbers on cyber attacks, just for your information, just about how bad it's getting. Uh, one thousand one hundred sixty eight weekly attacks in the in the fourth quarter of twenty twenty two. 38% more cyber attacks per week on corporate networks in 2022. The US experienced a 57% increase in overall cyber attacks. But this one, the last one, is the one that's most important. 62% of the breaches were caused by the third party supplier or vendor. So if you remember the Target hack that occurred, we remember Target got breached, but it wasn't. It was actually their vendor, their HVAC, high, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning company, that got breached. And then they used that connection in order to get into Target. That's just an example. But over half of all the breaches come from not the company, but their partner, their vendor, their supplier that got breached. And then they use that to get in. So if you heard about SolarWinds or Kaseya, that's exactly how these companies are getting breached. So if you look at the, num the, the top two causes for breaches, use of stolen credentials, which happens anyway, everywhere, and then ransomware. So this is why ransomware has got to be so bad. If you look at the top six industries under attack and the number of dollars, healthcare is number one, has been number one for 12 years, and then tribal nations are number two. So unfortunately, if you're a tribal nation healthcare, 
you've got a really, really big target on your back. So I'm dealing with several different Travel Nation healthcare companies right now. And this is one of the areas that we're trying to really lock down and help them. These are where the losses are coming from, but uh, that doesn't mean that that's the uh, total number of attacks. Uh, still, we've got you know all these groups, government, education, manufacturing, retail, financial services, and that doesn't mean just banks. Uh, all those companies are being attacked, uh, the, the most anyways. So enough of the bad news. Let's then turn this around. How do we do something to protect ourselves? So let's get into that. Let's identify some strategies that we can use to prevent a ransomware attack from happening and what to do in the event that one occurs. So the first thing is, and this actually comes off of a, a real environment, a lot of people think that while a cyber attack happens, I'm gonna run back to the, to the uh, router or the switch and I'm just gonna start pulling cables and isolate it. Well, it doesn't work that way. In fact, this is the worst thing to do. Uh, you start pulling cables like that and not only will you bring down your own network, but you could actually have the ransomware or the malware actually invoke what's called a destroy operation, which means that the, the malware will go out there and you know, wipe everything clean that it's got access to. So, oh yeah, you, you may have stopped the attack from propagating further, but you, you may have just uh, you know, shot yourself in the foot. Okay, let's talk about security controls. There are three types of controls. These are safeguards or countermeasures that the industry uses in order to detect, counteract, or minimize the security risks. And those are technical, administrative, and physical. Now, this is an important part, again, the key is up there, uh, in understanding not just, you know, like if this was a quiz, oh, which, what are the three types of security controls? The reason that this is important is to understand that security controls don't just come in one kind, one type. The technical ones are things like technology, uh, a, a router, a firewall, an IDS, an IPS, you know, intrusion detection system, intrusion prevention system, something like that. Uh, administrative could be uh, the the processes that you do, the policies that govern how you're gonna do things, um, the way that you um, use an encryption key or a code or database management or something. Physical would be things like, you know, the servers, the software, the things like that that are actually physical in nature and how do we protect those? So um, these controls as we're going through them have, you know, in their background, one of the types, but the type isn't the important part. The, the important part is, what does the control do in order to protect the environment? And we're going to talk about each one of those. So part two, this is where we talk about prevention. How do we stop this bad stuff from happening? So we're going to give you, and we're going to talk about the top 10 security controls, but we're not going to go through all of them. But just understand that if you put in these 10, just these 10 security controls, 90% of all ransomware could never happen. And the reason for that is because most of the ransomware that occurs today is occurring through one of these main three, four, five uh, different security controls. So if you have these controls in place, then the ransomware could never get in, could never be able to do the destruction or the, uh, the damage that it does. So let's start with the first one. Control number one is called inventory. And in this one, it's very simple. All you wanna be able to do is make sure that you know where 100% of, oops, 100% of all your computing hardware is located. Uh, is it on the network, when it's on the network? And the key thing is you can't um, misplace or not know about any one device. And I'll give you an example of the reason why. Is you wanna know that you've got 83, for example, machines on your network. So that if an 84th one would come on, A, they shouldn't be allowed to be you know, just plugged into your network and automatically come onto your network. But B, if something does come onto your network, why did it get on there? What's it doing on your network? Who owns it? And is it, a, is it a, an unauthorized user or is it something malicious going on? So that's why you wanna know about 100%, not 99.9, .9, uh, just one machine, not knowing about that one machine uh, has brought down many, many companies. So again, the reason the 100% is there, you gotta know everyone that's on your network. And the most important part is check for any unauthorized devices that get, uh, would maybe be able to be added to your network or get onto your network. And if you can be alerted to those immediately upon getting, you know, the, getting access to the network, that's the best one. We call it a best practice. 
Control number two is approved software. So approved software means having an inventory of all the software that you're gonna allow your users to be able to put on their machines. So you give them a list of, let's say, you know, 20 different kinds of software, Microsoft Office, you know, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, those kind of things. And then you list all of the software that they can install and they can't install anything that's not on that list. Now, the reason this is so important is one, you wanna make sure that they're not installing software that, that could be malicious or that they have no idea that it could be bad software. An example is um, if you download a, a video, a lot of times they'll say, sorry, I can't play the video because I don't have a codec, which means a player that recognizes this kind of a uh, video. If you go out on the internet and you download the codec to play that movie, chances are over 50%, one in two, that that codec is gonna have uh, malicious software built into it, which means that when you install that software, now your machine and your company, your tribal nation has been corrupted and maybe you've got malware or maybe you just, everybody goes down and you lose all connections. So that's important. But the other part is to make sure that the software is supported, that it's getting the kind of vulnerability attachments to it and, and that the company is still supporting it and making sure that any known vulnerabilities have been wiped out and making sure that the product or the software is still being um, handled and cared for, maintenance. Then ensure that the processes are in place to make sure that unauthorized software can't be purchased, which is a big one. Uh, so if you're, you know, if people can go out and, you know, just buy any software they want and they've got admin rights on their local laptop to be able to install it, well, then you've lost control. Uh, being able to download software, you can block that from about any kind of a, a browser proxy or any kind of a internet security system. Uh, but the key thing here is making sure unauthorized software doesn't get installed on any machine. And then the last one is perform a monthly check. The only authorized software has been installed. Now, this is only for those companies that don't have the ability to use what's called a whitelist, which means Here's a list of the 20 kinds of software you can install, we're gonna allow you to, and then everything else is a blacklist. Now, some companies will say, here's a white list of the things you're gonna install, but they don't have a blacklist because nothing off of that list you know, can be installed. So there's several different ways of operating in this way, but the key thing is keep this unauthorized software from being installed on your systems. Control number three is data protection. So data protection means, how do I um, know about what data I should be protecting? How do I make sure that it's stored and it's stored properly? How do I make sure it's backed up and that I can restore from that backup, which is a key part? And then how do I get rid of that data? How do I know when to get rid of that data? And then what's the proper way to get rid of that data? So all those are included in that. Uh, a lot of people ask, well, why is it important to get rid of data? You know, why should you have data retention limits? The key reason is, is if you're storing data for, let's say, 10 or 15 years, that's just more information that you've put out there that could be stolen and, you know, value to somebody else. Where if at least if you're getting rid of that data off your network, storing it, backing up, getting it out of the environment, then at least that's information you don't have to worry about, A, getting stolen, or B, having to restore after you have something hit your company. So um, the last one on that one is, if your company should ever go under a legal attack, which means you know a, a, some lawsuit is filed against you or whatever, having a limited amount of data to have to go through will save not only time, but also a lot of expense. Um, and a lot of discoveries in legal side, they will say you have to prove all of the data that you have and that you've gone through it and looked for this kind of information. So if you have you know, 10 terabytes versus one terabyte of information, uh, it's gonna take your company a lot less time uh, in order to go through it if you're storing just the data that's necessary. Uh, again, encrypt the data yourself. Don't wait for a <laughs> ransomware to hit and uh, then they encrypt the data to where you can get to it. If you encrypt the data, then nobody can see it. And even if they encrypt your encrypted data, they can't use it now. They could lock it up and they could keep you from getting to it, but at least they couldn't do the next step in ransomware is to threaten to release that information out if you don't pay the ransom. So this is an important part, encrypt the data, 
That way, if somebody does break into your network, at least they're not going to get to that information and be able to easily extract it or see what's going on. Uh, if you've seen some of the latest um, hacks that have occurred, you know, like with NASA, the guys get in and they're able to look at all of these uh, different files and information that, you know, nobody should have ever looked at. Uh, designs on the latest aircraft that's available, you know, the F-35 and such. Those are the kind of things that you want to encrypt the data and make sure it never gets out. And then implement and enforce the equipment cleansing requirements. And what we mean by this is if you get rid of a server, if you get rid of a bunch of laptops that are old, they're only running Windows 7 or whatever, make sure that any data on those systems has been wiped out. Now, this goes for even things like routers and switches, things, because those systems also contain information that could be very, very harmful if it got in the wrong hands. Okay, control number four, secure configurations. Now, configurations are just the way that you establish and set up a computer, a server, a laptop, anyone. But what you wanna be able to do is use the best practices for locking it down. Now, everybody knows that Microsoft, they install so much stuff in their operating system so that you can be able to do a myriad of different things. But what you want to do is remove all of those things you don't use, lock it down. You know, there's there's 64,000 ports that are being used by a computer. Obviously, you know, most companies use maybe 20, 30 at the very most. So lock down those other 63,980 ports and make it to where a hacker can't come through a port that's unknown. Uh, that's just an example. The other ones are locking down to where you know old um, default passwords aren't being used or default accounts that are set up you know the admin account uh, doesn't have admin and the password is admin things like that uh, you should set up this gold image we refer to it which is the image that you'll use to install every brand new computer with the latest patches that way when you do bring up a new computer then the, all those vulnerabilities have already been handled, all the patches have already been applied, and all you've got to do now is do the patches that have been incremental since that gold image was made. So you want to review this gold image, you want to review your, your secure configuration process at least once a year because changes are occurring every month. If you don't know about those changes that are occurring on, uh, you won't be aware of it for the next time that you go, go through this. Uh, the, the last part in that item is adopt an IT framework. Doesn't matter which one, there's several out that are good. Uh, I, I personally like NIST, NIST, as the IT and cybersecurity framework, uh, but there are several others. MITRE is one of them. Um, but there's a lot of different frameworks out there that you can use, but the important part is to have one standard you're going to and have one standard of security. Uh, CIS makes several different standards. They got a level one, level two, level three, and it's basically about what kind of uh, heightened security do you want to have run on your systems? Uh, do you want to have the just the basic kind of security to where you're locked in like a company? Or do you want to be like Fort Knox or Lock, uh, um, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, uh, Northrop Grumman, those kind of companies to where you have to really, really lock down your systems? So a lot of different options there. But the big thing is have some kind of an IT framework decided and implemented. And then the last one, really important, establish a secure confirm a confirmation process for your network infrastructure. And what we mean by that is make sure that you have a process for how things are going to get on your network, how they're going to be taken off your network, how things will be added properly. You know, they will go through, they'll have the gold image installed, they'll have the latest updates done, and then boom, then we'll add them to the network when they're secure. Uh, we won't add anything onto the network, you know, in front of the DMZ unless it's gone through a change management. We won't make, you know, changes to the uh, the backside uh, behind our DMZ unless we're sure that there's no connection to the internet, those kind of things. So make sure you have that process in place to where you're going through and you're deciding on how things will be um, configured before they're added to your network. That's real important. Control number five we're going to talk about is account management. This is one of my, my biggest ones that, that I find has the greatest holes in it that are out there. And this is with admin accounts. Now, all accounts, admin and users, should be looked at, and you should see whether or not those accounts are valid, uh, whether or not the user is still there. You know, if the person was fired, uh, they their account should immediately have been disabled. 
after several months and making sure that they, you know, that uh, the account's not needed, then maybe deleted. But you've got to have some kind of a process of making sure that you're going through and reviewing what accounts are in there compared to what employees should be there. The key one here is the, un the use of unique administrative user IDs. So your admin shouldn't go in and just log in with an admin and a password. Because if something would occur, you couldn't tell which one of your admins did the problem, or it could have been somebody that got access to their, their uh, password and got in, and you'd never know. So you want to be able to go in, like myself, I would go in with Brian underscore admin G, something like that, and I would log in as Brian Greig with administrative privileges, where normally, if I'm just a user working, I would just log in as Brian Greig with user privileges, and I couldn't do any of the administrative kind of tasks that, that would be expected of me. Your reason you do that is if you're logged in as the user, just as a user, then if you do something incorrectly, if somebody gets your you know access to your system, they can't go in and take control of the network like they would with an administrative uh, password. The other thing is with admins is we always recommend the use of multi-factor authentication. We're gonna talk about that then a little bit then a later too. With passwords, I can't stress it enough, minimum length and complexity. I just got done reviewing uh, a company, a client uh, two weeks ago, and they were still at eight characters. Now we were able to see that um, this company with their passwords, about one third of their um, user IDs and passwords could be broken within two minutes with the, the level of passwords that they were keeping. Um, not just the fact that they were just eight characters, but that they were simple passwords, something like password one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, ABC, you know, ABC, one, two, three, four, five, you know, those are all passwords that would have met their standards, but that they were easy to guess and that they were easy to break. Uh, when you can break one third of a company's entire list of user ID and passwords in two minutes, you've got some serious issues. Password updates. Now, we used to always say passwords had to be updated every 90 days or even every 30 days in the environments I worked in. But now we're learning that if you make a good password, that password should be able to stay for a good 180 days. And the reason being is if you're changing the passwords all the time, typically people aren't remembering them very well and you get more calls to the help desk and such. But if you've got a password manager and you're using that in order to change the passwords, not only can you make them very long, as in, um, you know, a passphrase, which is much, much easier to remember. And using a password manager logs you in automatically to, you know, with really long credentials. But with doing that, it makes it much, much more secure than changing the password and having a short or hard to remember password. The last one we're going to have here is disabled dormant accounts. Uh, not only should you be going through on a monthly basis and sending out an email or something to verify that all of the people under every manager should be having those privileges that they've got or that they should even be employed or have an account, but also that you're going through and making sure that they have the correct privileges. Uh, if an account is deemed to have been disabled or uh, dormant as we call it, then either disable or delete those dormant accounts. An example that, that has been brought up a lot of times to me is if a woman goes off uh, or a, you know, her husband for paternity leave. You know, If a woman goes off for maternity leave, husband goes off for paternity leave. Now those are accounts that, that should be disabled until that person comes back into the company and then re-enabled. So you don't wanna delete the account, but you wanna disable it and then wait. Well, if the person doesn't come back, there were complications, uh, they decided after the baby was born, they didn't wanna work anymore, whatever, then you would go through and delete the account. But disabling allows you to make sure the account can't get access during that period of time that it shouldn't, and then re-enable it and everything goes back to the way it was. So very important situations in account management. Access control is, is control number six. And this is the process. And I, I stress that greatly. Again, back to the technical controls that we talked about, the three types. Um, you've got process controls. Uh, that are just as important as having technology. And in this one, it's a matter of how do we assign, revoke, and manage our access to the network, as well as how do we allow for associated privileges for those admins? 
So what we want to do is we want to utilize the concept of what's called least privilege, which means give the person the minimum rights they need, they need to be able to do their job. So if it was a um, just a user, they shouldn't be able to access the database system. Uh, they shouldn't be able to get into the network systems, the, the router or the switch and whatever. Uh, if it's a database manager, well, okay, they need user level and they need to be able to access the database, but maybe you don't give them access to the cryptology system. You don't give them access to the network devices and things like that. So you wanna keep them with the minimum level of access that they need to, do, to be able to do their job properly. And then this part we talked about a few minutes ago is implementing what we call multi-factor authentication, MFA or two-factor, 2FA authentication. And I'm sure you're aware of this, a lot of different ways you could do it. But the key one is if you log into a system with a user ID and a password, then what you do is once I've logged in Brian Greich with my password, it will send a prompt to my phone. And on my phone, I will say, yes, that's me logging in, you know, when I get the prompt. Or it'll give me a code and I enter that code in the system. And what that does is that's the second factor. So my user ID and password is my first factor to authenticate myself. The password, I'm sorry, the, uh, the dual factor is the second factor in my authentication process. Now, what this does is it keeps the bad guys out of your systems. It will literally stop 99% of the, the hacks that occur today because the person can't, even if they know my user ID and password, they still can't log in as Brian Greich because they don't have that second factor. They can't get to my phone. They can't get to how I'm actually in, going into it. So we usually recommend two-factor authentication on anything that has internet-facing applications. So if you're logging in via the internet, anytime you're getting in to remotely access your network. So if I'm working from home and I wanna get into the REDW, REDW network, then when I get in via VPN, I have to then use that two-factor to get in remotely. And the last one is every administrator should be required to have two-factor authentication. So if you've got administrative privileges, no matter what you do, where you are, when you log in, you should be required to use two-factor authentication. Okay, control number seven, continuous vulnerability management. What this means then is I'm gonna establish a program that will allow me to identify, evaluate the vulnerabilities, remediate them with patches, and report on where I'm at with that. Now, the reason reporting is so important is because, as we know, there's thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of patches that come out every month. Not all of them are necessary in your environment, but sometimes you can't get to them all within a two or three day period. Maybe it takes you a week, maybe it takes you a month. You wanna know which patches are most important, you want to know which ones you need to be able to put in your systems, and you want to be able to then know which systems haven't got patched and which ones should be in line to be patched next. So having that automated patch management system is very important, but also what we find is most critical is a lot of companies aren't doing what's called the automated vulnerability scans. What this means is there's a system out there that goes out there and scans the system and sees whether or not they actually have the patch installed. Now. A lot of people just don't understand that when a patch management system will go out there and install a patch, let's say it's installing a patch on my system and it's patch uh, 10,240, okay? When 10,240 was being installed on my system, something happened in the network. There was a glitch. There was a, uh, a little drop in the network and some of the code didn't get through. There was a code check and the patch didn't get downloaded properly and it failed. Now, what that means is everything after that patch may not get installed because it's looking for the previous patch to have been installed. Now, patch management system said, hey, I pushed the patch, but it didn't know that the patch didn't get applied. So everything after 10,420, 21, 22, 23 may not ever get installed on my system. So these automated vulnerability scans go out there, look, and they query the system and make sure that those patches that instead got installed actually got installed. Okay, control number eight, audit log management. When a hacker gets into a system, the first thing that we've learned that they do, they go after the audit log systems. Why? They wanna cover their tracks. So just like when a criminal goes and does a criminal act, 
you know, they shoot somebody or they break into a house or whatever. What do you see them doing on the movies? They wipe the gun down before they throw it away. They wipe the knobs and the handles and anything that they touched. They're removing their tracks so that they can't be caught. Same thing in computer crime. They want to get to the audit log system. They want to erase it and they want to get rid of all of the evidence of how they got in so that maybe you won't ever notice that they're in there and they'll sit there forever. Now, Verizon uh, data breach report uh, from every year that I've seen it, and especially again last year, shows the number of days that the criminals will sit in your systems before they're noticed. And it's usually right around the six month period. So that means once a hacker gets in and breaks into a system, if they get to your audit logs and they're able to erase those logs, they can sit in your system for six months before the average company will find out that they've got a hacker sitting in their systems that has access. This is why you wanna have an audit log management system working. You wanna make sure that it's collecting audit logs from all the systems. You wanna make sure that the audit logs can't be accessed, changed, or more importantly, deleted. Nobody should have access to go into the audit system and delete audit logs, even an administrator. The reason you do that is because if an administrator should get their password, uh, you know, revealed, hacked, whatever from a system, somebody logging in and that as administrator couldn't go in and delete those logs. You want to conduct a review of the audit logs every once in a while. And then you also want to very once in a, very often make sure that those logs are turned on or have a system that would alert you if any logs stop coming through from any system. That's a best practice. Control number nine is email and web browser protections. Now on these, these are some of the most important ones. Uh, most of the browsers that are out there today support, fully support all this kind of uh, protections. They utilize DNS filtering services and they block known malicious or suspicious websites. So most browsers are doing that today, but it's important to have this information turned on. It's important to have these functions enabled, especially in a corporate environment and especially if your people work off network, you wanna make sure that when they connect to a Starbucks network or the local cafe or whatever, that these kind of protections are enabled when they're not on the network so that their systems can't be hacked into and then uh, come in back into the company when they, when they come back in. Control number 10 now, this is one of the most important ones, malware defense. Uh, every kind of malware that's out there uh, if you stop it with this kind, with this kind of a control malware defense, then you would stop malware, ran, ransomware, you know, attacks, breaches, everything from occurring. But we know that this doesn't work all the time. Uh, every day, there's over a million new signatures of new malware that gets released. So the companies are constantly uh, trying to keep up with it. The key thing is, is most anti-malware systems will recognize malware based on heuristics, which means a pattern. So it might not have a signature for it, but it sees something like it, it recognizes it, it blocks it. But the key thing is, is unfortunately, users are out there, they can disable or they can turn off their malware in some systems um, if they think that their machine is going too slow or whatever. What we recommend is going into your management console for your anti-malware system and making sure that your users cannot disable or turn off their malware. And if they do, then it should at least alert you to tell you that, hey, Bob's turned off the anti-malware on his computer. You know, let me go over there and ring Bob's neck, you know. <laughs> but uh, the key thing is don't allow them to do it. And if they can do it for some reason, then at least alert somebody in management when they do turn it off so that you can take care of it. Uh, awareness and understanding of malware techniques is important. Uh, we always recommend everybody to go through cybersecurity awareness training some regulations and standards for a lot of different industries require every person within a company to go through security awareness training every year. Uh, we do that here at REDW. We take training every month, in fact. Uh, that includes social engineering, social media training, um, social engineering, uh, insider threat, those kind of things. But one of the key things we found is not just the awareness is important, but building a culture of encouraging the individuals that if they do something wrong, oops, I clicked on that link, on it, I, I really shouldn't have done that, they'll report it. They're not worried that, oh, you clicked on that link, oh, you're out of here, you know, you're fired. 
You don't want to do that. You want to make it to where if people do something wrong, they feel comfortable with reporting it right away. Because if they don't and they let it go, it could be worse for the company than if you know that, hey, you know, Jane just clicked on the wrong link or she clicked on this invoice that she thought was a real invoice and, and now her machine's doing something weird. If Jane reports that right away, much better for the company than if she just goes, oops, nobody will ever find out. Okay, to recap, here's the top 10 security controls. And we say just the top 10 because there's lots of others. Uh, if you go into the NIST um, 800-171, there are 110 controls in there, but a lot of them go into these 10 categories. Now, if you remember anything, just these 10 categories, and you can get a copy of this presentation after we're done, but if you go in and you remember these and you ask these questions within your company, within your tribal nation, your casino, your hotel, your healthcare, your hospital, whatever, your company, if you remember these and ask the questions, you're going to make your company much more secure. So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to go into breakout session and we're going to then ask you a question and we're going to then have the time to be able to discuss those questions and actually give you a little bit of training of the things that we deal with on a daily basis. And what that is then is we're going to talk about in this breakout session, and you're going to be moderated with one of us experts, we're going to talk about what questions would you ask based on these 10 um, controls we just talked about that would get you an answer as to whether or not there are any cybersecurity risks in your organization. What would be the questions you'd go back and who would you ask? So let's go ahead, uh, Allison, if you want to uh, open us up for the breakout sessions. Okay, we're back. We had a great, great breakout session. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to uh, kind of tell us how, how the years go? Uh, we talked a lot about access, access controls is kind of the direction we segued, um, especially with um, MIP database and being in the cloud. What's the access controls in place with that? If there's multi-factor authentication, especially with it being a cloud software, you don't have a whole lot of control of it, you know, being on-premise. Um, and then also just talking about the gaps that I see, um, that I've seen just through audits with the whole formal process of access control. Who's authorizing the access? Is it centralized from HR going to one individual or is it a hodgepodge of managers just communicating that this person needs access, you know, having that formal process in place so that, you know, we, we're not having these gaps. We're making sure that everybody's getting the access that they should have. Fantastic. We had a couple of really, really good ones um, that were discussed on ours. Um, the, the one I'm gonna key in on was the talk about um, data backups being important, but the, the more critical part is the data restoration process being tested. Uh, according to the industry, 81, 82% of all restoration processes fail on the first try. So not only do you ask your, your, uh, your company, you know, hey, are we doing backups? But more importantly, are we doing um, restoration testing? Uh, and the other one was, um, we see this all the time out there, but I, I can't believe that somebody actually noticed it, uh, was to go to your IT manager and say, you know, hey, I hear that um, some people on our laptops don't have anti-malware installed. You know, do we ever do a test? Do we ever check? Do we know that everybody has, you know, anti-malware installed? You know, McAfee, Symantec, you know, Norton, whatever. And what we find on the audit side anyways, is when we go in and look at those laptops, we'll find one or two or three or five that don't. And that means there's a break in the process somewhere. So mm -hmm. I was really impressed the fact that we had a user out there, a, a person that actually said, hey, this is one of the questions I'd go in and ask. And, and they guessed it right about going to the IT manager. You wouldn't go to the CIO. Uh, he'd probably just say, I don't know. I, I thought we had them all. You know, <laughs> you'd go to the IT manager who could actually say, yeah, let me check on that. Uh, I thought we had everybody, you know, covered, but let me check. And sure enough, you'll find out that, you know, hey, we missed somebody. Well, then you got to figure out why. That's the most important part. But that's the whole thing. These questions lead to answers and figuring out why something has failed. That's the most important part. So thank you. Thank you to everybody that participated in the breakout sessions. It was exactly what we hoped for. So thank you for the participation. 
let's uh, continue on in here. I'm going to give you, and again, we got a nice little gold uh, key here. These are my five prevention tips. Now, Brian, you'll need to reshare yes. your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. It unshared. Thank you. So we learned something new today. We learned that when we go from a breakout session, we uh, the system automatically mutes us. And we learned that uh, when we drop sessions, the, we, uh, we got to reshare. So two things I've learned today. So thank you. Okay, so hopefully everybody sees that. Top five prevention tips. This is my little bonus for all of you people joining here today. Now, I've investigated in my career over 350 security events. That means a malware incident, uh, a laptop being stolen, a you know system not functioning, a breach in a system, you know somebody got hacked into, whatever. What I've come up with is these top five tips. And this is... For those people that are, that are sitting here and listening today, these are the top five. If you did these five, most of the breaches and hacks would never, ever be able to occur. And the reason for that is because these are the top ways that people are getting in is the lack of these controls and systems. So we're going to start out multi-factor authentication. I don't think I have to say any more about that. Uh, and all of the systems that get breached usually are done through an administrative password or a systems password. Uh, if you had multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication on your system, they could never get into the system in the first place. So that one's an obvious. Second one is VPNs. In this day and age, I'm amazed at how many people still do not use VPNs for remote connections. All the information traveling from your laptop across the wide open internet to your company is going through what's called a clear channel. That means I could plug in anywhere along that route and be able to watch everything you're doing. So if you think that the information sitting when you're sitting in your home is secured and protected, you're wrong. I'll give you an example. If you're on a cable network, Everybody that's on that network until it gets to the actual connection can view, it's called sniffing, the data that's going on that network. So I have a, the ability, if I was on a cable network, to watch everybody, all their email, all the things that they're doing, unless you're connected on a browser that has a little lock on it, which means HTTPS. That means that the information is being encrypted and it, and it can't be uh, reached. But for most of the systems, you'd be able to see it. So VPN is very, very important. Vulnerability and patch management, we talked about that one. Most breaches originate in the exploitation of a known vulnerability. The Colonial Pipeline, the one that took down the entire East Coast and the Southeast United States with uh, oil and gas, that was because they hadn't updated their email server in five years. It happens. Security policies and procedures, Jennifer and I, we see this all the time. When we go in and work with a company, half of our clients come to us after they've been breached. Half of our clients come to us before. They're concerned about their security. They want to be more secure. And what we find is they don't have even the basic policies and procedures. Now, if you don't have a policy and a procedure that tells how your financial systems are going to work, and how you're going to react when somebody tells you to change the routing information of a you know million dollar payment. That's the kind of incidents that we see happen all the time. If you have these things documented, those, those problems, those breaches would never occur. Backup recovery, I think we beat this dead horse. Um, it's not just about backups. Everybody typically is doing backups. The most important part is recovery testing. So. If you do that, you can recover from a ransomware. You can. If you're not, doesn't matter if you get the code, you may not be any good with restoring the data. So there's my top five. Okay, here's some references. Uh, again, this will be in the, the handout uh, the, with the presentation. This is a great uh, website, the CIS security website. It has a listing of all the controls, goes into details on them and everything else. Folks, these are the same controls that we use when we're auditing a company and we're getting paid to do it. We're giving you this information so you can go back, have a little bit more information and knowledge about what we do, how we do it, but we do this in much, much heavier detail. We know the things that you should be working on. 
and the things that you can wait and maybe do later. We actually build those actionable plans. So one way to stop ransomware, the only way is we cut off the supply. You can't stop these guys from working. They're making too much money. You've got to take cybersecurity serious. You've got to perform those risk assessments so you know where you've got risks. Improve your cybersecurity protection using those 10 controls and those five tips I talked about. And if we do that, we're going to stop ransomware from working. And we're going to cut this down from $8 trillion this year to maybe lower than that. Let's hope. Wrap this up and say thank you so much, Brian and Jennifer, for all the insight. And thank you for those that attended today. We really appreciate it. You know, uh, reach out to our RDW marketing team for any copies of the PowerPoint that you've seen today. In addition to that, you know, we, we're doing our best to provide, you know, this free information out to our, our clients and to, out to Indian country to making sure that you know, everybody's on top of uh, what's going on. Uh, please stay tuned. We will have another webinar, and this one is going to be over investments from our investment wealth group. So we we try to, you know, do our best to uh, let you know everybody know that you know we're just not, if you will, uh, bean counters accountants, but this is a real uh, full service firm that can provide you um, services in all all realms that, that you serve. So thank you so much for attending today, and looking forward to working with you soon. Thank you.